book show with Streets Online. Entertainment made easy. Hello again. Penny Vincenzi started her writing career as a magazine journalist. That was followed by a series of increasingly successful novels. Now she's embarked on a truly massive undertaking. No Angel is the first volume charting the social upheavals in the first half of the last century. It's also a love story and a study of moral ambiguity. Now, come on, you've given yourself a lifetime's work here. What years do we cover in this one? Uh, 1905 to 1920, 21. And it centres around a publishing house, based on a real publishing house? Absolutely not, of course not. But um, there were, it's about a family, and, you know, they all started as families, you know, the Macmillans and the Collinses and the Murrays and the Blackies, they were all families. So they were family businesses, and all my books are about families anyway, because, you know, families are such wonderful, seething you know, wonderful murky waters. Um, and so it seemed a very happy marriage, the publishing and the, and the family. You see, I learnt something from your book. You oh, give the, <laughs> as, uh, the number of books that were published in 1900 and how that doubled in only 10 years. So Amazing. this was a true growth industry. It was a huge growth industry. And all sorts of interesting things I discovered, which was that an enormous number of books were published uh, in the First World War that soldiers took them out with them. Um, you'd think the thing would collapse, and in fact, it was, it was a very good time for publishing, as was the Second World War. So it, I've learned an awful lot, actually, myself. So that's always a good for you, isn't it? It starts with a headstrong young woman who's got a man in her sights and she's determined to do anything. And actually, her strategy is very modern. Oh, very modern. But, you know, I don't think we've changed very much, you know. Um, we've been around for millions of years. I don't think the biology has actually changed very much at all. Yes, so she gets pregnant, so her parents can't stop it anymore. So, and she goes through her life doing what she thinks is right. And she does the what-if of this book. All my books are what-ifs. What if you do something wrong if for the right reasons? Does that make it right? You know, can a, can a wrong? And she does a lot of quite questionable things, but always knowing herself that it's the, it's the right thing. And, you know, she, she has a lot of comeuppances along the way. So she's a very interesting character, I think. You know, she's, um, she's one of my favourites. Yes, okay, it's almost a political question, is it? Isn't it? You know? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's quite, it's, a, it's an all-time all, all question, but it is quite political, yeah. It's very, um, relevant. Y you pose the questions, you actually give us the answers. It would be nice if you did. <laughs> um, well, I kind of lay all the evidence out and then I don't actually sum up. Um, but, I mean, one of the things she does is she has, a, she has a friend in the slums, a very, very poor woman who lived, and I, I researched this very, very carefully, um, they lived in a, two rooms, a lot of families, huge families, six, eight, ten children live in two rooms. The husband um, as long as he earned about a pound a week, they could get by, and these men would walk two hours to wor work, two hours home again. And this, this particular family, she got, became very fond of, and they had a little girl called Barty, and Barty was, by the time she met her, the ex-baby. And the ex-babies in these families had wretched life. They were tied to table legs because they couldn't be allowed to roam because it was dangerous. And so she one day arrived, and everything seemed rather difficult, so she took Barty home with her. And she was only going to take her for a while, and the mother was very grateful. And this child stayed with them forever and grew up there. And the, and the terrible conflict in her life because of this, I mean, you know, it was in some ways a dreadful thing to do. But she knew it was the right thing to do. And so at the end, you listen to Barty talking about it, and you listen to Celia, and then you have to decide what you think. Um, I don't actually say. No Angel is published by Orion. Penny Vincenzi, thank you. Thank you. Now, finally, an author who made his mark with a series of novels chronicling the lives of a group of bohemians in San Francisco. Eventually, the tales of the city books were dramatised for television. Now, Armistead Moppin has written a darker work based, in part, on his own life. Well, it's autobiographically... Um, well, let's see, it's emotionally autobiographical. I think that's the best way to, to put it. I've always found that my writing is most effective when I'm actually reflecting on real experience. 
but I also have a storyteller's uh, head. So uh, I try to find things in my own life that, that trigger certain emotions, and then I give myself the freedom to, to mess with the facts. Your protagonist is a storyteller. Yes, he is, and he's, he's rather close to me, uh, although I reserve the right to change certain details when they serve the story better. In fact, that's really the theme of the novel. There's a term that's introduced very early, as you know, uh, jeweling the elephant, that was invented by my ex-partner, who noticed that I had a way of, of taking a story and embellishing it beyond <laughs> all recognition. And it's, it's not really a form of lying. It's, it has more to do with... Uh, well, storytelling. The protagonist speaks from a position of heartbreak. Uh, yeah, that's the big part of it. I broke up with my partner about four years ago, and I had a general idea for the central mystery of the story, but it had always been a sort of uh, Nick and Nora Charles thing, very soft kind of story because there was no conflict in it. Well, life has a way of providing those things, and when Terry moved out, I realized that I was going to have to deal with that in some way. I've always translated my life through fiction. So in the midst of that sort of heartbreak, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life and where I was and what this meant, I sat down and wrote the first chapter of the book, really as a way of explaining things to myself. That's how I use fiction. I think that's the way a lot of writers use fiction. I've always loved uh, the notion of writing what I think of as a thriller with a heart. Um, or a thriller of the heart, if you want. Um, I love the movie Vertigo when I was a teenager. I've always loved it. I think it's the single work of art that has affected me the most because of the notion of this deeply intimate story uh, about longing and obsession and some very real human things, especially as regards uh, middle-aged humans. Um, and, but yet, that has, is driven by mystery but a mystery that doesn't have murder and mayhem, but a real, a, a, a profound mystery at the center of it. Your character tells stories on late night radio. And then he gets given a manuscript that's written by a young boy who's a listener. Well, it's a brilliant piece of work uh, and uh, talks about this boy's horrendous life uh, of sexual abuse, largely by his parents and his escape from them and the way in which he was adopted by a foster mother. And it's a very brave and funny document that uh, moves this writer, this, this radio storyteller, to such a degree that he wants to contact the boy. He also wants to contact this 13-year-old, whose name is Pete Lomax, uh, because the boy is a fan of his. He actually has listened to this man on the radio and he's heard this man's voice and regards him as a father of sorts. He's kind of fixated on him in a, in a way. Uh, the stories have helped the boy get through the roughest part of his recovery from this abuse. And uh, so this friendship begins on the telephone between this 50-something uh, man and this 13-year-old boy. The man is gay, has never had children. Uh, the little boy has never had a father. And they're kind of a natural match. The older man uses this to sift through his own experiences. That's right. And then something happens. And I don't want to really take it beyond that, because the real fun of this novel, I think, is uh, the ride it takes you on, uh, where you go with it and where your mind begins to wander. The Night Listener is published by the Bantam Press. I'm Mr. Ed Moppin. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. You can find out more about the books featured at our website, www.sky.com slash bookshow. Or you can email us at bookshow at sky.com. Next week, Maeve Binchy on her latest full-length novel, new fiction from Linda LaPlante, Jay McInerney and John Banville, and true tales.